Hey guys, uh, I am Matt Rickard uh, from Google, and I'm going to be talking to you guys today about building Docker images without Docker. Um, this was the working title for this talk. Um, I changed it because it hit a little too close to home. Uh, how to create compressed tarballs in the most complicated ways imaginable. Um, but so, agenda. Uh, basically, what I'm going to talk about in this uh, this talk. Uh, why do we care? Um, obviously, you are motivated to to come to this talk, so you probably have your own motivations. Um, but basically, why we're trying to kind of split this monolith apart um, and separate uh, the the build uh, tools. Um, what did we try to do? There have been, uh, I mean, this talk became a lot easier in the last few months uh, because there have been a lot of products that have come out uh, addressing this this uh, this problem, um, and a lot of them have kind of similar uh, approaches. But I'm going to break it down into kind of three three major approaches that I saw. Um, what problems did we run into? Um, basically, what worked, what didn't, um, and then kind of what we can do about that, and and what we should be thinking about for the future. Cool. So just a little background on me. Uh, I am a software engineer at Google San Francisco. Um, and I work pretty exclusively on open source software. So anything uh, container related. Um, you know, more recently, uh, the Kubernetes developer experience. Um, so I'm a maintainer of Minikube. Uh, and a lot of the tools in the Google Container Tools organization, which is, which is fairly new. So that's Scaffold, uh, DistroList, which I'll be talking about today, um, Canico, which I'll also be talking about today today, and uh, container diff, among others. Um, shameless plug, we're hiring, so uh, if you're interested, just email me or talk to me after. So uh, why do we care? Uh, the, the biggest one is kind of the, the separation of concerns. So the idea is that we started with Docker. We had this huge monolith. We had the daemon. We had Docker run. We had Docker build, um, which was great. It kind of gave us that end-to-end -end workflow. Um, but now, as kind of the technology matures and the pipelines become more defined, um, the idea is to kind of split these into um, you know, separate concerns. So the ones I've kind of identified are build, pull, and push. I kind of grouped those together, even though maybe they could be split apart. Um, Login and run. Um, and the idea is to kind of We've already seen this kind of from the run side with things like cryo, um, but now we're kind of approaching it from the build side as, as that matures. Um, security, uh, I won't talk too much about security in this talk because that's, it's kind of a runtime issue, but you can see that you know, the, the division is not exactly clear, um, but it's, it's worth mentioning. Um, reusing and kind of consolidating infrastructure, so it's a bit silly that we have some infrastructure to build the artifacts, and then we have different infrastructure to run the artifacts. Um, and the idea is that we should really be able to reuse the clusters um, that we run things to, to build things. Um, Reproducibility. Um, so this is kind of from two angles. It's you know the reproducibility that's not in your Docker file um, because of the run command, um, but also reproduci reproducibility um, in terms of the actual image metadata. Um, so timestamps and, and configs and all that sort of stuff. Um, minimal images. Uh, the idea behind this is that. You really want kind of your runtime dependencies in your application, and have that be the only thing in your uh, in your in your Docker image. Unfortunately, it's it's hard to produce those images, and once you have them, uh, there's not really the right tools to kind of debug and, and figure out what's what's going wrong. Um, and then this this last part is is kind of related to minimal images, but. Control over your images, um, basically constructing your layers in a smart way, and um, you know the contents inside of it. So separation of concerns. So this is just kind of a you know very basic Venn diagram. I actually had a lot of trouble making a Venn diagram in PowerPoint. I is you know it's very confusing, um, but. So there's build, there's push pull, and there's run. Um, Docker is obviously kind of at the intersection of all these things. It does everything. It's a daemon. It's always running. It's always doing all this stuff. Um, we've seen kind of cryo be the intersection of run and pull. Um, pull kind of being uh, the idea that it needs to pull the base image um, in kind of the build context before it runs it. And what I'll be talking about mainly in this talk, is the, the intersection between build and push and pull. Um, and a lot of these tools kind of explicitly call this, this division out, um, which I think is great. I think that's what we should be aiming for, um, and I think that's a, that's a great division. 
in an ideal world, you know, maybe we could even split out the push-pull from the build and have your build not responsible for kind of setting up the build context, pulling the build, uh, pulling the the kind of um, the context for the build, and then also not responsible for pushing that artifact, so that your build doesn't really know anything about authentication. Um, but that's that's in an ideal way. Um, so. Uh, Another thing I'd like to talk about in this talk, and I'll kind of call it out in some of the tools, is that there's kind of an implicit dependency between build and run. Um, even though I've divided them here, when you have the run instruction, um, it's actually pretty much the same uh, as you know a Docker run. So the idea is that we should we should think hard about do we need this coupling? Uh, we've had a lot of the the kind of flexibility of Docker run, um, so we're a little bit spoiled in that sense, but. Actually, you know, making that, that a clear division between build and run, I think, will be really important, and we'll actually see that um, more so as we try to run these builds uh, in a runtime such as like Kubernetes or something like that. So the, the first kind of category I want you to think about when I talk about these tools is, is Dockerfile lists. Um, so does a tool support um, building from a Dockerfile or doesn't it? Um, you know, an image is worth a thousand words. In this case, most of them are apt-get update and apt-get install-y-no-install -dash -dash recommends. Um, you know, this is just from the Postgres image uh, on Docker Hub. You know, this is boilerplate that probably all of us in this room have written um, and kind of moving away from that model. Uh, but at the same time, we already have all these Docker files. We need ways to kind of continue building uh, those images. So the other kind of dimension that we should be thinking about as I kind of go over these tools is, um, does it have a daemon or does it not have a daemon? Uh, I think kind of the, I think everyone would agree that not having a daemon for build is a good thing. Um, you know, it's performance, it's easier to run in kind of CI/CD pipelines, um, it's easier to run in kind of containerized environments. Um, it's a great step towards kind of decoupling. Um, and the ones that I'll, I'll talk about uh, are build a image and, and Canico. So this is, uh, this is kind of an overview of Builda, uh, if you haven't heard of it. Um, it's basically this, uh, this tool to kind of build Docker images with no Docker daemon. So it was kind of like the, one of the first tools that, that really took this paradigm of no daemon and, and really pushed it. It can build from a Docker file. Um, it can also build through kind of a series of these imperative commands, which the CLI actually looks a lot like um, the Docker file instructions, which is quite interesting. Um, so you have build a add, build a copy, build a from, build a run, and then some other ones. Um, the interesting thing here is that they've taken kind of an imperative approach versus kind of the you know declarative configuration paradigm of Kubernetes and, and all those other tools. Um, while I think it's probably a lot better than the Docker file, um, I think they kind of envision this to be used as, as uh, some sort of foundation for other tooling to, build, to be built on top of it to support kind of alternative front ends. But, it's interesting that it's imperative, especially in this world. Um, another tool that's kind of daemonless is uh, Image, uh, which is a really interesting tool. Um, I actually took the first two bullet points from the README because it was so spot on. Um, the first being the commands UX are the same as Docker build, push, pull, and login. And so if you think about that kind of Venn diagram, this is exactly kind of where we want to target. Um, and I think that's it's the right division. And having the UX and the commands be very similar to Docker is a great way to help us kind of transi transition into these more specific tools. Um, it's a standalone, daemonless, unprivileged Docker file and OCI compatible container image builder. Um, that's a lot. Uh, basically, uh, all of these tools are, are OCI compatible. I'll try to um, I'll try to say when they're not. Uh, but the idea is that the the process is is very similar. So it's just a matter of kind of writing the the right configs and writing things in the right place. Um, but. I won't talk too much about unprivileged, um, but it's it's really important in the sense that so it uses these run C rootless containers so that it runs your image not as kind of the root user, um, which is which is really interesting and we've been kind of again spoiled to be running our our, our containers as root so you can do things like sudo apt get upgrade and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, but 
in terms of security, if you don't necessarily trust your runtime, um, then you definitely need to be doing something like this uh, if, if you're running in kind of a multi-tenant unsecure environment. So the, the kind of third dimension I want to talk about, and this is maybe a, a bit radical, um, it's kind of builds that are runtimeless. Um, so the, the idea behind this is that it doesn't actually have any runtime. It's not calling run C. It's not calling any of that sort of stuff. It's kind of deferring to, to whatever environment you're running in. It in, um, and the idea behind this is that you know they're more portable. There's no dependency on the actual runtime dependencies. Um, so historically, that's been you know Linux namespaces and C groups. Of course, not every um, runtime actually uses those. But it's it's interesting that your build tool shouldn't really need your runtime dependencies. Um, and so that you can run your builds cross-platform or in uh, lots of different infrastructure. Um, of course, there's less complexity. Um, you know, there's no kind of nested containers. There's no nested overlay FS. Um, we, we know how that goes. Um, and it's, it's a lot easier to nest inside of uh, existing containerized environments. Uh, the analogy I'm, I'm maybe looking for is kind of you know, nested VMs, right? You can, you can do them under the kind of the right constraints, but they're slower and um, they're much more complex. So the, the first one I'm going to talk about in this kind of runtimeless category is distro list. So full disclaimer, I, I worked on this a little bit, so I'll try to be unbiased. Um, it's, it's a little different um, in that there's, there's no Docker file. It can't interpret a Docker file. Um, it's built on these kind of rules Docker, which are Bazel rules um, to, to build uh, a Docker loadable compatible tarball. Uh, on the flip side, it's declarative and reproducible, which are things that I haven't really talked about um, that much in this talk, but I think are really important. Um, uh, reproducible in the sense that it, it strips timestamps and um, knowing all of the dependencies of build time and using the kind of Bazel build system, um, it's able to be declarative and you're able to get the same outputs for, for the same inputs, um, which is really great for caching. It's really great for um, you know, constructing your images in kind of reproducible ways. Um, there's a lot that kind of comes from this. It's rebasable. So the idea is that if you, um, if you patch a, a security vulnerability or, or, or something like that, um, you can do that and rebuild the image without actually rebuilding your application. And you're not kind of stuck with that weird um, you know, layering in the Docker file where you can only cache the things before the instruction that changes. Um, and it creates these kind of minimal images. The idea behind the name DistroList was that they were images that weren't based off of Ubuntu or Debian or anything like that. And you know, it, it becomes, I mean, you really think about it when, you know, should you really be deploying, you know, thousands of Ubuntu-based uh, Ubuntu images? Do you really need that kind of full operating system? Is that your application's runtime dependencies? Um, the answer usually, 99% um, of the time, is no. Um, so really, the, the, the benefit of this is that you have nothing but your, your application and your runtime dependencies in your image. Um, the, the downside to that is that you have nothing but your application and your runtime dependencies in your image. Um, you, you, you don't really realize that that means no shell, that means no package manager, um, none of the nice things that kind of help you debug. Um, so this approach is great, but there's still a lot of tooling and a lot of work to be done to kind of make this a viable approach. And the downside is that it's written in Bazel, and that's kind of another thing to learn. Um, and it won't interpret your Docker files because it doesn't support um, the kind of run instructive. So this is just uh, just a snapshot of what what this looks like. You know, these are these are Bazel rules. Um, we have a way of kind of injecting packages because it turns out that you really do need to inject packages um, into your application. You don't need the package manager, but you do need the, uh, the packages. Um, so it's, it's kind of an interesting problem. Um, but the, the kind of takeaway from this was that you don't necessarily need the runtime. Another tool that our team uh, kind of uh, recently open sourced is Canico. Um, so Canico is really interesting because it was made pretty exclusively for the case of running your builds on a Kubernetes cluster or in an already containerized environment. It actually won't work outside a container. Um, it interprets Docker files. Um, so we've kind of re-implemented all of the Docker file instructions, run, env, from, 
all that sort of stuff. Um, and it runs kind of completely in user space. So the kind of two main things that need to run in user space are the actual snapshotting. Um, so how do we actually create the layers after things are ran? So it works kind of naively um, you know, without a union file system. So it's a bit slower. Um, and it's kind of similar to the container D um, naive snapshotter, if, if you've seen that, or um, Docker's VFS. Um, it's, it is a lot faster than that, though, because we don't need to maintain kind of all of the state of layers and all that sort of stuff. Um, there is no runtime, and there's no nested containers. Um, so there's no complexity there. On the flip side, you don't get any of the security of um, nested containers. So if you're running something like image and you don't trust your kind of parent runtime, um, you can get around that by running uh, run C in uh, rootless mode. The, the idea behind this is, um, I don't know if you guys got a chance to see, uh, we just uh, put out a blog post about Gvisor, which is our kind of um, sandbox container runtime. So we actually do treat that as a security boundary um, runtime. So using something like that in your Kubernetes cluster, plus Canico, plus Kubernetes, equals kind of secure on cluster builds so that you can do builds on cluster in a multi-tenant way, which is really interesting. So I think in the future, we'll, we'll see a lot of, we'll, we'll see more kind of trusted runtimes and, and not a lot of this, this nested complexity um, for uh, the builders. The, the last kind of category I want to talk about is, these aren't necessarily, um, they're, they're tools, but they're not binaries. Um, they're libraries. <laughs> uh, so basically, all these tools use one of three libraries. Um, there's two that we published, um, Google Container Registry and Google Go Container Registry. Um, Container Registry is written in Python, and it's the basis of the kind of distro uh, tool that I talked about. Go Container Registry is fairly new, um, but it's basically the Go port of that library. And then, of course, there's Containers Image, um, which Builda and Image and, and some of those other tools use. Um, and the idea behind this is that we can construct and kind of manipulate images programmatically. Um, so that becomes really important, you know, just kind of for basic registry interactions. So you need to do something like retag an image. You need to do something like uh, mutate an image. Um, it's really useful for that. And kind of more importantly, it can serve as the basis for kind of alternative front ends as we start to explore, you know, what's next after the Docker file. Um, so just an overview of this uh, Go Container Registry. Um, we use it in kind of all of our Google Container tools. Um, so Container Diff, Scaffold, um, we just switched Minikube to use it, Canico and Distroless. Um, and you can see these are just kind of the diffs of when we removed all of the boilerplate and replaced it with this library. So it's a pretty significant um, you know, cognitive load taken off uh, by switching to this library. Um, it can build images from scratch, um, and it can mutate images. So a lot of, um, a lot of uh, activities that seemed kind of impossible before become really easy when you're able to kind of manipulate these images programmatically. So you can do things like append a layer to an image, um, rebase an image, flatten an image's layers, um, retag an image, all kind of programmatically in a way that kind of preserves the, the metadata for the, the Docker file. So I guess that was just like a quick overview of, I mean, there's like so many tools that I, I didn't cover, um, mostly because either I'm not familiar with them or, you know, we wouldn't have had time. Um, but kind of what's, what's next in this space and, and, you know, what I'm thinking about and, and what I hope some of you will think about. Um, reproducibility. Um, so it's possible. Um, it's not so possible with, you know, arbitrary Docker files. Um, so we might need to think of something there. Um, but at least we can kind of make the, the metadata reproducible. Um, decoupling build from push-pull. Um, you know, this is a, in a very ideal world. Um, I think we can start to build our tools with this in mind. Um, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be kind of um, separate to begin with, but it, I think it's important to think about. Um, Language-specific optimizations. Um, so as we move, uh, you know, if, if we're sticking with the Docker file, if we're sticking with this, these kind of paradigms, uh, we really n need to start thinking about what optimizations we can make for languages and frameworks, um, because we can make some pretty significant optimizations. Um, new front ends. Um, so 
things other than the Docker file. Uh, BuildKit um, by Docker has really been thinking about this and kind of abstracts away a lot of the the, the DAG and the, the caching complexity. So tools like Image use uh, BuildKit kind of under the hood to, to not have to re-implement all of that. Um, but they're kind of actively thinking about what's next after the Docker file. Um, flexible builds without a runtime. Um, you know, again, we've been spoiled with the run command. Um, how do we get away from that and into more declarative and reproducible builds um, while still having the kind of flexibility of being able to install things um, from commands? And then the last point I think is actually kind of interesting. Um, we've already carved out what the interface for um, the runtime looks like. So um, cry is to run as, you know, is there an equivalent um, for build? Is there, you know, some sort of build interface that, that we can build um, and, and work with to kind of abstract away um, the API for these tools? And, you know, I, I don't know what the answer is. There's been some work done um, to kind of carve out what this looks like, um, but there's a lot to, to be done. So w I guess what would, what would some Dockerfile alt alternatives look like? Um, so a container native package manager, right? Um, you know, the, the beauty of, you know, the Docker file and containers is that we can reuse the Linux package managers. We didn't need to kind of uh, remake that part. Um, on the flip side, those package managers aren't reproducible. Um, when you do uh, an app get upgrade and an app get install, you're kind of at the mercy of when you're running that because um, those packages are, you know, guaranteed to change over time. Um, so figuring out, you know, there's been some work done in kind of uh, the Nix OS space and the Nix package manager um, for kind of reproducible and declarative um, package configuration. Um, but I think, and you know, some people have tried to port some of those ideas to containers. Um, I still think there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, and I think there's a lot of good ideas that kind of happened in that space. Um, Again, builds without run are hard. Um, you know, we've we've been able to craft our images in such kind of a flexible way and an expressive way that it's hard to kind of pull back from that and convert some of our builds to um, more declarative and more reproducible. But I think we we do need to do that. And then, kind of the the last one is just smarter construction of layers and base images. Um, you know, layers are what we're given. Um, you know, it's in the spec. You know, could we have gone more granular than that? Possibly. Um, but that's what we're given. So that's our kind of our caching layer and that's our composability layer. Um, so really thinking smart about how we're composing those layers, what layers are in your image. Um, I don't think when, when we're writing a Docker file, you know, maybe we're thinking of, you know, instruction is a layer, but I, I don't think we're, we're, we're going the extra mile to actually make sure that we're, we're doing this in kind of a composable way and minimizing the amount of base images that we're maintaining or the layers that we're maintaining. So I just want to talk a little bit about some ideas of language specific workflows that exist out there and what, what has worked really well. Um, so the idea is that we can, we can really optimize for frameworks and languages without getting rid of the Docker file, without getting rid of any of this, this stuff, and we can do it kind of today. Um, you know, there's some ideas behind build packs of we have these kind of, you know, language specific uh, containers that we can just kind of take your source code in and plop it in there and then we can run that. Um, you know, that's, that's something kind of like the Heroku pass model. Um, I think there's, there's definitely a lot of analogies with containers there. One tool that um, we, we've open sourced is um, Jib. So Jib is kind of, it's a Java specific tool and it really fits into your Java workflow. It can kind of be called from your, your, your Java native tooling, Maven and Gradle. And it does like really smart layering of your image so that you can just take your jar files, put them in the container and then deploy them so you get those really fast kind of um, build and deploy loops. Um, and by default they use the, the distro list images but there's ways to kind of configure that. Um, another tool that, or kind of paradigm that, that we've been working on is uh, faster than light builds. So this work lives in the, the runtime's common uh, GitHub repository. Um, by the way, all this stuff is, is on GitHub. I just left out the GitHub portion, but you should be able to find um, all of them in, in the right paths. Um, and the idea behind this is that 
it treats um, language level packages as layers. Um, so that becomes really important uh, when you're doing caching. It really speeds up your builds, it speeds up your deploys. Um, and so we can do that for languages like PHP, we can do it for languages um, like Node.js, um, and there's, there's some other languages that we can make optimizations by kind of introspecting um, what the run directives are and splitting those out into kind of more reproducible um, and cacheable layers. Um, that's all I got. Uh, I got some time for questions, um, but thank you.